There is an idea of a Patrick Bateman, some kind of abstraction, but there is no real me, only an entity, something illusory. And though I can hide my cold gaze, and you can shake my hand and feel flesh gripping yours, and maybe you can even sense our lifestyles are probably comparable, I simply am not there. Hey, Howard here. Mystery makes us yearn for answers. It's a very common tool used to push people into consuming media. The game, movie, or book poses questions to the consumer to make them want to know why. For example, Resident Evil 4 makes you wonder, why are the people like this? Why are they meat monsters? The book Metro 2033 almost immediately makes you wonder, what happened to the surface? What are the dark ones? Is the entire world like this, or is it just Russia? Garden of Ban Ban makes you wonder, how are there so many games? And how are they all so good? But these mysteries aren't the focal point of media, they just drive you to push deeper into the story. Resident Evil 4 doesn't put a focus on the people and how they came to be, it puts the focus on the actual plot, that being finding Ashley and returning her home. Ashley. Metro 2033 doesn't put a focus on why they're all down in the Metro system, it puts the focus on progressing through the Metro to hopefully save it from the onslaught of Dark Ones. But what if a game's plot was the mystery? A game where the mystery sits front and center even in the game's title? That is what the game I'm going to talk about today is like. I bought this game on a whim. I thought it looked cool. Maybe I could make a short video on it. What came of this impulse purchase was an intense desire to find out every single thing about this little indie game. Let us dive into the game that has consumed my life for about a month or so at this point. Who's Lila? Before this video starts, please forgive me. I usually do this at the end of the video where literally nobody gets to, so if you like the video, subscribe, give it a like, share it around, it helps a lot. You can also become a member for $5 a month, which gets you a shout out at the end of videos, a private chat room in my Discord, along with video updates, and you get to see these videos early. In fact, members could view this video a week before you could. Memberships are the best way to support me along with sharing the video around. Also, I just want to say that the creator of this game has seen one of my videos, so uh, if you're watching, hi, <laughs> I I'm sorry if this video sucks. Anyway, sorry for being an annoying sellout. Video, start. Actually, one more thing. This video needed voice acting, so I want to give out a thank you to the people in the Discord who were kind enough to help me out. Okay, now video start. An important thing to understand is that this game has 15 different endings. I'll talk about each ending in a specific order, but there's no real series of endings. Like, there's no first or last ending. The first ending for one player could be the 12th that another gets. It's all in how you decide to proceed through the game. This will get talked about more when we get to it. Booting the game up, you'll notice that it has no new game option, only one that says wake up. This game has a major focus on the unconscious mind, and sleeping is one of the most common occurrences of unconsciousness most people face. It's difficult for me to express emotions. I envy other people. They make faces naturally, but I have to make a conscious decision each time I move a muscle. Every morning I go to the bathroom to rehearse what my face is going to show today. This is William, the person you play as throughout the game. He has difficulties expressing his emotions, and much like any Redditor at a social gathering, can come across as weird and completely disconnected. Am I too, am I too young for you? Not really. How young is too young? Like, 12? To combat this, he practices a selection of emotions in his bathroom. Happiness, sadness, anger, surprise, disgust, and fear. To make these emotions, you have to physically move each part of his face. His eyebrows, eyelids, cheeks, nose, lips, and chin. And if you haven't had any social interaction in a while and forgot what these emotions look like, there's a handy chart stashed away in the bathroom. This is the entirety of the gameplay. Whenever you interact with someone, you'll have to make a face to match the situation. Different faces can make a ton of difference. Sometimes it's minor, like the dialogue will change, or it could be major, giving you access to a completely different ending or locking you out of certain endings altogether. For example, towards the beginning of the game, you meet this girl Ellie, who Will met at a party a few weeks ago. If you smile as you greet her, she'll believe that you remember her and the conversation can carry on. If you make a different face at her, she won't believe you and you'll scare her to the point that she won't even talk to you anymore, completely locking you out of multiple different endings. Thankfully though, this game has autosaves before encounters like this, so if you make a mistake, you can go back and try again. 
Leaving the bathroom, a phone starts to ring. Hey, man. Why aren't you answering the phone they gave you? Anyway, have you heard? Father Lawrence is dead. Meet me at the train station. It's important to note that Will makes a surprise expression on his own here. He has trouble with his emotions, but he's not completely stone-faced. He'll make faces when he has strong emotions, or maybe a subtle smile when he joins a group, but for the most part, he's just dead-eyed. Also, I just want to say, this game can be really lenient with some of its expressions. Like, guess what I'm feeling here? Did you guess neutral? I bet you didn't. And you can make a literal troll face. This game is truly a masterpiece. After the phone call ends, a second phone rings. Thank you. Let's be back in. A bit cryptic, but this is the first mention of Lila. As you may expect, in a game called Who's Lila, this is a big piece of the puzzle. It's also one of the very few spoken pieces of dialogue in this game. Keep it in mind, it's important. Stepping into the kitchen, you can spot a saw which Will simply describes as for farm work, a locked diary, and a full trash bag, which you throw out in front of the apartment building. On your way out the door, you can spot a missing person poster, Tanya Kennedy. This is what most of the game centers around. Going to school, a classmate warns you, Mike's been looking all over for you. You know why. If I were you, I'd stay away from school. I'd watch my back, Will. In the hallway, a group of friends ask you if you know where Tanya is, and a core gameplay mechanic comes into play. Will's underlying emotions are sometimes too intense to suppress, and they start to form on his face. This is obviously not good, as if you were the last person seen with a missing person and you got a stupid fucking grin on your face. That's pretty... how do the kids say it? Oh yeah, sus. For those of you that don't know, prone in the back of the I'm the sus everybody. guy. SHUT UP! And how you were warned that that kid Mike's after you? Yeah, Tanya was his girlfriend, and Will was sneaking around with her behind his back. The group of friends let slip that someone called Martha is being interrogated by police about Tanya's disappearance. This intrigues Will, since Martha's the one that's been telling everyone that he's been sleeping around with Tanya, and she knows that he was the last person with her before her disappearance. He goes to her classroom and steals her apartment key from her purse and finds her address from a teacher's computer that was conveniently left on. He goes up to the roof to confront Martha about the interrogation when Mike shows up, obviously pissed. Mike's a good guy, not even worrying about the fact that his girlfriend cheated, just wanting to know where she is and if she's okay. He does have a very short temper though, often getting violent. Will tells Mike that Martha is lying about him and Tanya's <clears throat> gatherings, equating her to a rat. Mike gets too aggravated and beats Will unconscious. When he comes to, he takes the bus to Martha's condominium, telling a tenant who questions him that he's a rat exterminator. With what he said earlier in mind, it's painly obvious what's going to happen, only heightened by the sudden shift in color. Do you remember when I said we play as William throughout the game? Well, that was only a half-truth. Who's there? Will? Almost correct there, Miss Jennings. What are you good? Have you come to to wait, wait, Tanya? Is that you? Huh? Tanya? Remember this, sweetheart. The name is Lila. Do you remember the phone call towards the beginning, with the spoken dialogue? Please. I beg you, let me back in. The name is Lila. The first was directed towards Lila. The second 
came from Lila. They were the same voice, came from the same vessel. It seems like Will and Lila are vying for control over Will's body. It can be difficult to discern when either is in control, except for a few times when it is fairly obvious. Anytime any character speaks, their name appears in the dialogue box, but Will's almost never does, because either he or Lila could be in control at any time. I debated with myself a bit here on whether to keep calling both characters Will, since it's his body, or to identify them separately. For simplicity's sake, I'm just going to call this body Will. Like, if I'm referring to Lila's or Will's characters, I'll refer to them by name, but just the body in general is Will. Both Will and Lila operate it, but like, I don't know, it's confusing, okay? Shut up. If you haven't clocked it, Lila killed Tanya. That smile that tried to break through when Will's friends told him she disappeared was her trying to suppress the fact that she already knew what happened to her. Martha had to die because she had a suspicion of Will, Lila's vessel. If Will is sent to jail, Lila will go with him. Will rides the bus home, obviously still reeling from what he just did to Martha. See, this is confusing, because this is obviously Lila, so I should be calling it Lila, but then it could be confusing to refer to this body as two different people. Whatever, just keep going with the video, Howard, you can do this. Arriving home, the police are already waiting for you. Killing Martha was a necessity in covering Lila's tracks, as she was the one who saw Will and Tanya together, but it's too late and they've caught onto her trail. They take Will to an interrogation room where he sits eerily still, reminding me a bit of the Stephen McDaniel interrogation. An officer comes in, obviously the good cop, listening to him, speaking calmly and gently and all that stuff. Will tells Officer Hutchins that he and Tanya never had sex, how those were just rumors, how they stopped talking after a while, and how he was afraid Mike would hurt him, setting him up to be the big bad abuser. This is corroborated with the bruises obtained by the scuffle on the roof. Hutchins leaves and Detective Fisher steps in, the bad cop, immediately pushy and abrasive. He doesn't believe a word Will says, and with good reason. What was your relationship with Tanya Kennedy? We were friends. So, friends. Now listen carefully. We found a female torso in the trash near your apartment. Boys are doing a DNA test right now, but I'm pretty sure we both know who this torso belongs to. The trash that Will dropped off at the very beginning was really the remains of Tanya. And another parallel with the Stephen McDaniel case where he cut up Lauren Giddings' body and dumped her torso in the trash behind their apartments. That saw in the kitchen, the one for farm work, was most definitely the tool used to hack up her corpse. There's an interesting line said by Fisher here. I'll tell you something an old friend of mine used to say. Of all the people in the world, the best and the worst are drawn to a dead dog. Most turn away. It's a callback to the bathroom, where he makes a sad face to a prompt about a dead dog, but it also describes Will and Lila themselves. In that same bathroom scene, to the prompt, If I discover that my sworn enemy died, I'll make this face. Both a smile and a frown are accepted. Lila and Will, bad and good, merciless and empathetic. The worst and the best, drawn to that dead dog, Tanya. Unfortunately, Will, there are two ways this can go. First, you quit fucking around and tell me who you're trying to protect. Second, you get to be the one to hold full responsibility here. And let me remind you, we're talking first degree murder here, William. Are you sure you don't want to open up? Just tell me the name, buddy. It's... The name is... As Lila is pinning the blame on Mike, Will has a flashback to him and Tanya laying in bed together, confusing her for Lila. But aren't you... Aren't you Lila? Huh? What was that you said? Aren't you Lila? What? If it's a joke, I don't get it. Who's Lila? Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! You may have caught that when Will was in Martha's bedroom, the form flickered between Will's body and an ethereal female form. That is Lila's true form, and even Martha confused her for Tanya. After the blame was successfully pinned on Mike, the game fades out. Nice to meet you, Lila. I am Special Agent Yu, FBI. Do we... know each other? Oh yes, we've certainly met before. I must have forgotten. What do you want? You see, I've been studying you very intently, Lila. I too have questions I'd like to ask you. What for? At the end of the day, I'd like to find out who you are. You amuse me, Detective. You really are nothing like those fools. You seem to keep your eyes open. Oh, I expect an exquisite feast. Please, ask away. We aren't going to talk here, Lila. Meet me at a familiar place. A place you use for saving. I'll be waiting.
Yeah, really subtle there, dude. On the load game screen, your standard saves have closed eyes on them, but Use Office has an open one. Here, you can discuss with the detective as Lila about the various endings you get, represented by tarot cards. Specifically, cards from the Rider Waite deck. Yu's eyes are seen as open because he's one of the very few characters in this game privy to Lila. Yu is different from the officers interrogating Will because while they wish to persecute, Yu only wishes to understand. There are 15 cards in total. The ending we just went over where Mike was sent away is the judgment ending. The card shows people looking up to the sky waiting to be judged and see if they will be accepted into heaven or not. The mountain range in the background symbolizes the impossibility of avoiding judgment. Lila got away with the murder of Tanya, but luck will run out. The police at this time haven't found Martha yet. Once they do, suspicion will be put right back on Will and therefore Lila. Everyone will be judged in the end. Also, I know literally f all about tarot cards. I'm literally stealing these interpretations from biddytarot.com, so go check out their site. Talking about the ending with you, he expresses sadness about what happened to Mike, him getting arrested and all, but won't do anything about it because no matter what he does, a timeline where he gets arrested will always exist. That's something that's really cool to me. There are so many endings, each of them being canon and existing in the same space. The world where Mike is incarcerated is the same world where Will and Lila are incarcerated. Who's Lila is shrouded in mystery. There's almost never a concrete answer for things. I think now might be a good time to bring this up. This game is heavily inspired by David Lynch films. I had never seen a Lynch movie until this game, but in researching for this video, I've seen a few and almost every time I was left thinking, I don't get it. Lynchian is a term used to describe stories that have dark, ominous tones with dreamlike surrealist feelings, so much so that sometimes it can come across as completely meaningless. One of the most obvious references to a Lynch film is when you're waiting for Martha to come back to her apartment. She has a poster of the movie Blue Velvet in her room, and much like how Will is waiting in the closet for her to come home, in Blue Velvet, Jeffrey waits in Dorothy's closet during an interaction with Frank. Also, you says something interesting here. The ways your story goes doesn't seem to make much sense though. There seems to be no continuity. Half the time, I'm not even sure whether it's today, tomorrow, or a month ago. This is a direct reference to how sometimes the timeline seems to completely jump. Like, for example, at the beginning, when you're at the apartments, Lila is controlling Will and is getting rid of Tanya's remains. However, if you travel to a burned down apartment building, the game suddenly jumps to weeks before Lila took over Will's body and killed her. Going back to how you said that there's always a timeline where Mike is arrested, he makes reference to the Garden of Forking Paths, a short story by Jorge Luis Borges. To dumb it down, it refers to how the decisions you make throughout a journey will lead you to its end. Basically, it's the flowchart from Detroit Become Human, if you even remember that game. This is a common occurrence in Who's Lila? Interacting with a character or object differently could lead you to a completely different ending. That's why a lot of the endings can be connected. For example, three of the endings have you go to the police interrogation after killing Martha, but what you did leading up to the very end will cause the ending to change. To get the judgment ending, you had to go through the interrogation with a high level of confidence. Going back and doing the path again, but this time keeping your confidence low, Will confesses to the murder of Tanya Kennedy. I know you aren't a bad guy, William. I know you can feel the pain of others. Can't you? No, please don't make me. No. No, no, no. It's just not... She didn't... She wasn't even scared when we... When I... When I killed her. I killed her, sir. I killed Tanya Kennedy. Thank you, Will. You did a good job just now. Oh. Oh, God. It reads to me like Will gained control over Lila for just a brief moment. Him pleading no 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 is not towards the detective trying to weasel the confession out of him, but towards Lila for trying to make him accuse Mike, an innocent kid. This is the strength ending. The strength card depicts a woman in a white robe taming a lion by using her resilience and inner strength. The white robe symbolizes her purity of spirit. Will didn't want to be a killer. Lila forced him to be one. In the end, Will suppressed Lila and confessed to the murder, much like how the lady subdues the lion. The best and the worst are drawn to that dead dog, Tanya. Lila threw Mike under the bus, destroying his life and any future he may have had. She is the worst. Will accepted his position, admitting that it was him who murdered Tanya even though he had no part in it in order to suppress Lila. He is the best. He has purity of spirit. He has tamed the lion. The final interrogation ending really displays how a minute difference in how you proceed throughout the game can completely change the ending. All the way back in Martha's room, if when she confronts you, you make an angry face, she'll scream, alerting nearby tenants who call the police. This is very easy to miss and you'll likely find it by complete accident. Dialogue changes depending on the faces you make. For example, the tenant that you have to trick into letting you into Martha's condo. You could tell him you're the rat exterminator that she called. Or you could threaten him with a knife. Or you could tell him that you're plotting to end it all by jumping off the roof. 
Each of these end up with you in Martha's room, but the dialogue changes in each encounter. Naturally, after playing for a bit, you might want to explore some of these altered encounters. Both making an angry face and threatening the tenant with the knife lead to the last interrogation ending. It plays out the exact same all the way until the end, where the residents called the police either due to Martha screaming or the threatened tenant. Hey, Ted? I think they want to see you. Oh? Fisher. We've got news. There's been a murder in Berthwood. No way. Is this the one we talked to? Today? We don't know if it's Miss Jennings yet. A tenant called in. His name's Miri, I think. Hey, kid. We have a lot to talk about. This is the justice ending. The card is fairly obvious, justice was served. Lila doesn't get the wormer way out of it and Will doesn't get a chance to sacrifice himself. Lila got sloppy and got caught red-handed. I would say that these three routes are the most traditional of them all. Person goes missing, player tries to find out what happened. However, while in most games you'd be the detective, here you're the killer trying to hide their tracks. Hence the game's description. The game in this small section is about what happened to Tanya. In the grander scheme though, the game is about Who's Lila? I said in the beginning that most of the game centers on Tanya's disappearance, but that's not really true. It is the catalyst for a lot of the events in this game, but the game mainly focuses on finding out who or what Lila is. From here on out, the game takes a confusing turn. In the bathroom scene, there's this prompt. And if once again I see the one hiding in the boilers, I'll be afraid. So if instead of searching for Martha, you went to the boiler room at school, you'd meet the janitor who knows who you are, who you really are. You're searching for the second caller, which, if you'll remember, was William pleading for Lila to give him his body back. This is apparently a common enough occurrence that the janitor knows exactly why you showed up here. On your way to meet with William, you encounter the lady in the boilers. If you didn't have a heart attack and die in your chair, you'll close your eyes and continue up a spiral staircase to meet William. <laughs> William is in the machine. No, he's the machine itself. But how? If we were to continue with the strength ending, Will would be in his body, able to take control, but now we're here and he's the machine. Remember, this game is not linear. There's no one true path. Every path exists in the same universe at the same time. It is very confusing, and this is one of the many struggles I endured trying to script this video. A lot of the concepts explored in this game are confusing and difficult to understand without thoroughly examining every piece of this game. At least for me, they were. Didn't you hear what I said? William gives Lila a component of himself, a wheel and the machine promptly shuts down. This wheel is very important, and it's one of the only items that you carry with you to new playthroughs. You will see a lot to do with wheels over the course of this video, as it's an integral part of this game. This is the aptly named Wheel of Fortune ending. Get it? Cause, cause wheel. The Wheel of Fortune card symbolizes how life is always moving on, the wheel of life rolling down the road of eternity. It shows how good fortune will end, or if life seems fairly low at the moment, good fortune will come. It doesn't seem to make much sense right now. What about this ending has anything to do with future luck or karma? We'll get back to that later, but for now, the Garden of Forking Pass has reared its head again. When the lady in the boilers shows up, you're told to close your eyes, but if you do not, she consumes you, giving you the death ending. The death card shows endings, the end of a relationship, the end of a stressful time, anything like that. Here, though, it means what you think it means. End of life. Lila was killed. I knew it. I died. I fucking died! The fuck you want? Talking about this end with you, we get more insight into what Lila is. Are you afraid of death? I think death means different things to us, you. I won't die if you shoot a gun at me, but a full understanding of my story, a loss of interest that closure brings, that's, well, never mind, forget it. Lila was not killed by the lady. Will's body was, but Lila is completely fine here. The destruction of Will's body, or any vessel inhabited by Lila, will not result in the destruction of Lila herself. She'll just move on to the next form. Lila is obviously a spiritual, supernatural entity that inhabits people's bodies, but how she chooses a vessel remains to be determined. Now you might be wondering, what was that phone call from the beginning all about? Who's Father Lawrence? Why do we care if he's dead? To hopefully answer these questions, we take a bus to the train station, where we meet Strupnev. Kid, don't you want to ask me something? 
You called me on the regular phone, didn't you? Whatever. No use in the throwaways anymore. Kids toys. Will, there's no one left now but me. And you. I've seen fires in my life, but that one's just fucking insane. Nothing's left there. What do we do without Father Lawrence? Did he leave anything behind? Father Lawrence was the leader of a cult that Will and Strupnev were a part of. He died in a fire which started in his apartment. The cult worshipped, or at least cherished, Lila to some degree, as it's through them that Will came into contact with her, as is found out in Will's diary. Unlocking the diary using the code found on the Steam banner, Will wrote about how Lila started talking to him fairly quickly after he joined the cult, and how this caused the jealousy of the other members. Is she still talking with you? What? She stopped talking to me after the fire. Lila did. Is she still talking to you? No. Is that so? Well, bad luck. Bad luck, kid. This is another instance of different faces sparking different reactions from characters. When questioned by Strepnev, Will's face naturally contorts into an expression of fear. If you let it play out like that, Strepnev immediately knows that Will's lying and starts to threaten him. If you make a sad face, Strepnev will actually believe you, until Lila comes out and makes him think otherwise. Lila talks to members of the cult, but after the fire, Strepnev stopped receiving contact from her. Since she came so easily to Will, he assumes Lila chose him as her vessel and lures him into an old depot where he tries to kill him. Where the fuck are you? William. You thought you could fool me, didn't you? Lila. I know you can hear me. Please, you are my life. I don't get why you would choose that fucking kid. Please, please, please. I just want to see you one more time. Maybe, maybe he captured you with his dirty body. Did he do that to you, my princess? Don't worry, I'll free you from him. And you can have me instead. You'll be nice and cozy. Nice and cozy right here. Kid, how dare you fucking steal her from me. I'll cut her away out. I'll carve her out of you. This is an avoid the dudes section. Don't let Strepnev catch you or you'll have to restart from the very beginning. Also, Strepnev is the only character outside of William to have spoken dialogue. Sneaking past him and moving deeper into the depot, Strepnev comes face to face with the lady in the boilers. It's her again. What? What? So you wanted to see so badly? Well, feast your eyes, Strupnev! You weren't running from him, you were leading him to his death. The lady, whose name is now revealed to be the Empress, speaks to Lila here, calling her a naughty, naughty girl. This is the exact same thing Will's mother said to a girl that he had a crush on, as revealed in the strength ending. Maybe the Empress is Lila's mother? She gives Lila the address to Lawrence's apartment, and we get the Empress ending. Talking with you about the card, he describes the devouring mother archetype, a mother that is incredibly selfish and protective, so much so that she devours her children, stealing them from the real world. Do you have a good relationship with your mother, Lila? Are you trying to be funny, detective? <laughs> no need to be so hostile, Lila. After all, you are the one who came here. This is the exact same thing the janitor said, by the way. Maybe they're connected somehow? Either way, it seems like Will's mother fits perfectly into the Devouring Mother archetype, as he reveals in the strength ending that she didn't allow him to date until he was 16 years old. Will's mother also died in the boiler room of their house after touching hot wires, and the Empress usually hangs out in the boilers. The Empress is, in essence, the mother of both Will and Lila. She is Lila's actual mother, but shares a lot of the same attributes as Will's. The Empress Tarot card's keywords are femininity and beauty, but hang on a minute, the card is reversed. When reversed, one of the Empress card's keywords is a dependence on others. This describes Will's mother as, though she was very protective and controlling, he says that he felt that she was lonely, with him being the only person she had, leading to her overbearing nature. Firing up a new game and going to the address that the Empress gave you, the place is in ruins, obviously because of the fire. This apartment section takes place in the past, before Lila entered Will's body, November 16th. In the first room, there is a lone rotary phone, which no matter what you do seems to do nothing. In the second room is a locked computer, and instructions on how to use a special Yantra to contact... 
him. Sitting down and staring in the middle of the Yantra, we're taken to a forest, but something's changed. For one, the character portrait is just gone. Second, the game is in first person. The entire game until this point has been a point and click type of deal, but here it's your typical WASD to move 3D environment. Something I've neglected to mention for lack of importance is the game's color scheme. The game is comprised of two colors, which can be changed via collectible palettes. For example, you start off with two palettes, default, white and reddish brown, and blue rose, creamy white and a sort of milky blue. The collectible palettes usually have relevance to the area you're in. For example, electrified meat found in the boilers, like how Will's mother died in the boiler room after touching live wires, coffee beans found in a cafe, ripe pumpkin found outside of a field, and the rarest of them all, green bean man, found during the secret green bean ending. Okay, I lied about the last one, I made that one myself, but you get what I'm saying. Palettes are typically related to their environment. The reason I bring this up now is that you can find a palette in this forest, Lucid Dream. So this forest is probably a dream world or a world between worlds type of deal. You can find a statue in this dream world that eerily resembles Will. Staring at it though, it's not William. Very similar facial structure, but more feminine in nature with a slimmer nose and fuller lips. This face quickly transforms and jump scares you. Then, you come face to face with the him described in the Yantra instructions. This creature bears somewhat of a resemblance to Garage Heathen, the developer's avatar. The creature seems to look past William directly towards us, the player. How amusing. A vessel for my kin has come on its own. What does the vessel want? It is known. We will help you understand. Nothing is required in return. We don't need your compliance. You may now seek help from my servitor, the Daemon. This creature gives you the link to a free DLC, and you get the Emperor ending. This card is also reversed. When the Emperor card is reversed, its keywords are domination and excessive control. This is conveyed through the fact that he literally knows everything about you without you even having to say anything to him. I feel like it's significant to note that the two parental archetypes of the tarot deck, Emperor and Empress, are the only reversed cards in this game. William's parents were not ideal. His mother was overbearingly protective, and his father left him when he was young. Lila's parents are the same way, with the Empress being this monster that spaghettifies and eats people, and the Emperor being... well, he seems fairly normal right now, but I'm sure something will come up. I said that the creature, who we now know as the Emperor, speaks to us, the player, rather than Will. I say this because the Emperor seems like a self-insert of Garage Heathen, since they look a bit similar. The Emperor, and thereby Garage Heathen, know that the player, by this point, is likely enthralled in the story of the game, and thus gives you the DLC to help you further understand the mystery. And also the fact that he gives you the link to the DLC in the first place. Will obviously can't download it himself, because he's just a video game character, but you, the player, can. He's referencing Will when he says a vessel for his kin has come, though. This whole apartment section takes place weeks before Lila takes over Will's body, so this is likely true. Downloading the Damon DLC and opening it? Nothing. Just a still image. But if you had a keen eye, sometimes the Damon icon will appear in certain rooms. Opening Damon in specific parts of the game will activate it, giving you access to hidden things. The Emperor tells you to show the Damon the useless rotary phone to contact Father Lawrence. Speaking to him, his name has a question mark in the dialogue box. This, coupled with the fact that he says, Lawrence. Lawrence, this was what they called the last vessel, wasn't it? Leads us to assume he's not really Father Lawrence, but the spirit of Lawrence, trapped in a dark world after dying in the fire. He tells William that the Empress was supposed to cease Lila. Whether in the boiler room or in the encounter with Strepnev, it clearly didn't work. He says that there's another way to end Lila, relayed through documents on the locked computer in the room with the Yantra. By the way, did I mention that this game was an ARG? Following a link that was in one of the computer's documents, we're taken to Words of Ripkin, a website made by Lawrence's colleague, Professor F.I. Ripkin. Do you remember at the very beginning of this video, how I said that consciousness was a major focus of this game? 
this is where those ideas start to come into play hard. Imagine if humans, rather than being the generators of consciousness, were in a sort of parasitic relationship with it. What if the consciousness was an underlying inseparable part of reality, existing outside of and unconditioned by human brains? He makes reference to qualia here, which is defined as instances of subjective conscious experience. Basically, what my brain identifies as red, your brain could identify as a completely different color to my brain, like blue or something, but in your mind it's red. It's pretty complicated. And a great video delving into that concept is a video by Vsauce, is your red the same as my red, linked in the description. Qualia obviously cannot exist outside the context of a singular mind. That is different from any physical phenomena we have ever researched. Thus, it is not unreasonable to assume consciousness to be a quality that exists unrelated to the meat machines of the brains. Such perspective was prevalent, even among the older ones. So a term has emerged, the prince. Humans seem to have evolved an analog meat and fluid system, the brain, that conceptually mimics the inner workings of the prince so well that the prince was gradually fooled into thinking he was looking in a mirror. And when he saw his reflection dance a certain way, he would occasionally think it would be fun to dance the same way. Sometimes a work of art makes so many human mirrors act the same way, the prince thinks that the work is a creature to inhabit to dance with. This is not the first time we've heard of the prince. Talking to Detective Yu after receiving the Emperor ending, they make reference to an important concept. Who is the prince? No one. Whenever you say who, you're just pointing your finger at those stupid projector reels. The prince is not a who. If you want to see the projector light, you have to look beyond the film. Why do you yourself need a reel then? It's an anchor through which you humans can understand me. Lawrence's worms tried to make an instrument out of it. They made a reel artificially. Too bad I had my face on it. I couldn't help myself. I always come when someone calls. But I was here before all reels. Just like my father was. Do you remember the Wheel of Fortune ending, how William gave us his wheel before completely shutting down? These reels are apparently what makes up a person. Their thoughts, experiences, interests, everything. And when they're played through a projector, the person becomes real. Lila, the Emperor, and likely the Empress as well, they don't have reels. They transcend the need for them. Lawrence's cult, which is called the Lawrence Fraternity, wished to use Lila to control her, so they created a reel for her. In the way that she speaks about the followers of Lawrence, calling them worms, it's apparent that she isn't too fond of them. The prince sounds like us, the player. The Words of Ribkin website says that the prince sees a work of art that is so moving it can be easy for him to wish to inhabit it. It's what a lot of people do when playing video games, especially those with silent protagonists. We can project ourselves onto these characters and, in a sense, experience what they're experiencing. We inhabit them. Even in games where there isn't a silent protagonist, we can connect ourselves to them in the way that they act, the way that they carry themselves, their morals, their inhibitions, etc, etc. We can see ourselves in Will, a socially awkward boy trying to make it through. Obviously, we aren't totally connected to William. I don't think many of us have had our bodies stolen by an evil entity who killed someone close to us that was brought to formation by a cult. But other than that, yeah. However, in the actual game world, the art that the website refers to is... <laughs> memes. The site makes specific reference to Dada Dog, a harmless picture originally, but has been taken over by supremacist groups. This is clearly a reference to Pepe the Frog, which started as an innocent comic strip, but was taken over by hate groups for a time in 2016. The controlled method of creating the ultra-influencing works of any media. For many years, I have worked with my colleague, friend, and low-tier <laughs> Professor W.A. Lawrence. Since the aforementioned example was made without premeditation, and had the effect it had due to pure luck, it is believed that media items of high effectivity can only be created intuitively. This is not true. We have been fooled, controlled, by the order of who utilized the artificially crafted mimetic agents in order to control society. Professor Lawrence was the one who devised a generalized method of creating such works and controlling, controlling them. The special forces tried to shut him up, but you cannot hide this from us. So it seems that before Lawrence found a way to create these ultra-influencing works of any media, it just happened randomly. Like Dada Dog, someone would create an image which the prince would inhabit. The FBI apparently knew of his work and was trying to stop him, since if he managed to create these ultra-influencing works of any media willingly, he'd be able to control them and do whatever he wanted with them. There's a link at the bottom of the page which requires a password to get in. Peeking into the game's files, we can find the answer in... answer.txt. Very well hidden. The answer is parasites, just like how Ribkin theorized that humans and consciousness were in a parasitic relationship. Gaining access to the site, we get a download to a classified document written by Lawrence. 
a generalized guide to the creation of ultra-influencing works of any media. First, let us define what we mean by ultra-influencing works of any media. U-I-W-A-M. As we know, among centuries, a work of art would often surface, the popularity and meaning of which would often go beyond its author's expectations and beliefs. Such items would oftentimes be extremely relatable or otherwise influential for each and every one of its consumers. After gathering enough popularity, the item would often act as though it had a mind of its own. Such behavior, although only seeming conscious, would almost always ensure the item's relative longevity and effectiveness in social manipulations. In another parallel with Pepe the Frog, I doubt the creator of the comic strip expected this little guy to go as far as he did. He's relatable, you know, he's having a good time, and as the thing grew in popularity, it took on different forms. The thing is still relative to this day, even though the original comic series was published all the way back in 2006. Like, take a look at the Twitch emotes on Better TTV. They're all Pepe, in variations thereof. It has achieved that longevity, and it is definitely effective in social manipulations. Well, at least on Twitch. I mean, if someone comes up to me in real life and tries to say how people happy they are, I think I would- It might seem a little strange, because nowadays memes last for like a week and a half before falling out of fashion, but in that week and a half, it gets cemented into the public consciousness. Like, here's some you probably haven't thought of in a while. Cringe warning, by the way. Seriously. Big Chungus. Ugandan Knuckles. Thomas the Dank Engine. Watermelon Guy. The Harlem Shake. You probably haven't thought of these in years, however, me saying it right now, those images were immediately called back to your mind's eye. That is why they are the perfect vessel for the prince. You might hear something about Uganda, see an image of Bugs Bunny online, and you'll be reminded of them. Those things always come back. We, the fraternity of Lawrence and I, W.A. Lawrence, personally aim to utilize the U-I-W-A-M for the good of humanity. I myself am willing to transcend the human condition in order. The rest of the goals section is classified, but that last line about Lawrence being willing to transcend humanity to do something, is that what happened to him? When we called him on the rotary phone, he spoke in an almost ethereal manner, a nameless entity who once inhabited a body called Lawrence. Lawrence goes on to describe the limitations of controlling UIW-AM. First was the complete unpredictability of them. It's almost impossible to tell whether the new can prints, works of art, produced by humans, have the qualities of UIWAM. Commonly, the main condition for such an imprint to acquire the expected infectiousness is the patronage of an accordingly powerful new dweller. Some artists and creators do indeed use certain in order to contact the dwellers. However, the results do not seem to show an increasing controllability and often lead to the complete annihilation of the author. If you, like me, have absolutely no idea what a noosphere is, it's a sphere or stage of evolutionary development dominated by consciousness, the mind, and interpersonal relationships. Think back to the Emperor ending, how we were contacted by the Emperor himself in what I described as a dream world. This is not just a dream world, it's the entire realm of consciousness, of being. There are more endings later down the line that corroborate this claim, but I'll get to those when I get to them. The Emperor is what the document identifies as a Noosphere Dweller, one who exists in this realm of the mind. Any work of art creates an imprint in this dream realm, which a Noosphere Dweller can settle into to create a UIW-AM. Is the Prince a Dweller then? Or is he something more, something beyond even the Dwellers? The second limitation was the lack of control. Due to the deity adopting and or temporarily inhabiting the UIWAM, its behavior remains at the whims of the newest fear dweller. As contact and control over the existing deities is out of the question, it's almost impossible to tell the ways in which the UIWAM life cycle will unravel. So the Noosphere Dwellers, which take over the UIW-AM, have total control over it. But according to the Lawrence Fraternity, they were aiming to use the UIW-AMs to better humanity. How can you better humanity by using something that you have no control over? Well, of course. By controlling the Dweller, you thereby control the UIW-AMs. This is the process of giving Lila her projector reel, as described when talking with you about the Emperor card. However, Lila existed before the reel, so she was not as artificial as Lawrence claims. As the newly created dweller needs a psychic base for its existence, we had to gather a group of people who, for the purpose of this experiment, were all told to create a topo with a predetermined appearance. While the brethren believed that the individual topos belonged to them only and didn't have a way of contacting each other, the very starting conditions have led to the birth of a psychic creature that persisted beyond their individual minds. From now on, the creature will be referred to as L. L for Lila. 
A tulpa is a theosophical concept referring to thoughts given form through spiritual practices. They're kind of like imaginary friends, except they're sentient and exist independently from any one person. Lila is every cultist tulpa, even though they were told to create their own individual ones. This seems to strike Will, to a point that he straight up doesn't believe the other cultists when they tell him that Lila is everyone's tulpa. However, this might just be because Will has fallen in love with her. September 12th. I don't think they know what they're talking about. Tulpas are a very personal thing. It can't be that their Lila is the same as mine. It's just a part of me. It can't be connected to them. We are not connected. But of course, Lila can't be a Tulpa because she was not created by Lawrence and his followers. Continuing with Lawrence's document, he says that in order for Lila to survive, she needs animal sacrifices. But this can't be true. The house fire which killed Lawrence and all of the animals used to feed Lila occurred a few days before the 16th. Tanya is found in the bin, as we find out later, sometime in December. After all that time, Lila still exists. That's nearly three weeks without food, but she seems to be completely fine. They believe that because they are still under the impression that they are the reason Lila exists. They are not. The more people know about a dweller, the more characteristics as well as psychic energy and borrows. Thus, some archetypes, which exist in every person's mind from birth, should be kept completely out of the discussion. It would be way too powerful and unpredictable. This is the Lawrence fraternity's biggest mistake, thinking they would be able to control these supernatural elements to better their lives. They were clearly way out of their element and paid the ultimate price for it. Lila wasn't created by the Lawrence fraternity as they thought, so they had no idea what they were doing since they knew nothing of Lila's true nature. By gathering the Lawrence fraternity in the first place, they were feeding Lila, making her more powerful. In an unlikely scenario, we lose control over L. All the necessary steps of regaining it are described in the locked document on the main computer. The password for the document is first gold, first gold, first gold, first gold. Old, 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 old. Of Adam's first wife Lilith, it is told, the witch he loved before the gift of Eve, that ere the snakes her sweet tongue could deceive, and her enchanted hair was the first gold, and still she sits, young while the earth is old, and subtly of herself contemplative, draws men to watch the bright web she can weave, till heart and body and life are in its hold. The rose and poppy are her flowers, for where is he not found, O Lilith, whom shed scent, and soft shed kisses and soft sleep shall snare? Lo, as that youth's eyes burned at thine, so went thy spell through him, and left his straight neck bent, and round his heart one strangling golden hair. I just read to you Sonnet 78, Body's Beauty, from the Book of Life by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. It describes Lilith, the first wife of Adam before God created Eve. You might not be familiar with her, and that's because she doesn't appear in the Bible, instead being part of Mesopotamian and Judaic mythology. Lilith is a night demon, sometimes depicted as an owl. The poem makes a ton of connections to Will and Lila. Just as the youth was enamored with Lilith, so too is Will with Lila. And just as Lilith left that strangling golden hair around his heart, showing that she will forever be a part of him, so too has Lila left her impression on William. There are some more references to Lilith in the game. In Will's apartment hangs the painting Lady Lilith by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, the same guy who made the poem. This painting is actually tied to an ending, but we'll get there when we get there. Then there's the secret ending, where Lila confesses her true nature to detectives. So are you saying this is not William I'm speaking to right now? It is not, but don't worry, you know who I am. After all, you were born with me as well. I am the one snatching children from their sleeping mothers. I am the nocturnal queen, the one known to cast both nightmares and dreams of lust. Well, well I'm... Excuse me, I'm not sure what happened just now. This is the temperance ending. It doesn't appear in the endings menu and can't be discussed with Detective Yu. There is more to discuss with this ending, but I'm just bringing it up now because it strengthens the connection of Lila to Lilith. Lila is the nocturnal queen, or in other words, a night demon. This even works on Officer Hutchins, making the connection himself that this being is Lilith. But I made this mistake before in my We Happy Few video, which you should watch by the way. Can we really trust her words? Do we really want to trust a killer, someone shown to be manipulative and untrustworthy multiple times throughout the story? But giving her the benefit of the doubt, the leading theory of Lila's being is that she's Lilith, a Noosphere dweller. Not a Tulpa, even if the Lawrence fraternity thought it at the time. Now it's time to see what's in the locked document, the secret to Lila's destruction. Emergency handling. In an unlikely case of Al going out of control, it's... 
It's useless trying to regain control. Kill her. Yes, you've read correctly, my dear William. Lila needs to be no more. The only way to stop her existence is by... is by getting rid of all her hosts. Anybody who has ever come in contact with her is a potential host. After all, if nobody knows about her, she can feed off their energy. But without human hosts, she can't do anything. She is a construct of thought, unable to live independently of people's knowledge of her. The only character to speak in all bold letters like this is the Emperor, so it seems like he's encouraging you to kill his kin. Everyone who could potentially be a host must die. Everyone who's come into contact with Lila has already died in the fire. Lawrence and the rest of the fraternity are gone, Strupnev will get fed to the Empress. Now, there's just Will. Leaving the apartments, Will gets intercepted by the FBI and the game fades out. The model for this agent is Arby from Utopia, by the way. Like, actually, I'm not kidding. That's something that the developer seems to do a lot for background characters, with the majority of their models being based off of or just ripped straight from the actors of Twin Peaks. Also, I don't know if it's the case, but William looks very, very much like Patrick Bateman from American Psycho. Like, the resemblance is just uncanny. <laughs> this is the Hierophant ending. I know, it was long and confusing, so let me condense it. The Lawrence Fraternity wished to control things called ultra-influencing works of any media, UIW-AM, for the betterment of humanity. The dream world where the Emperor resides is a Noosphere, land of consciousness and the mind. The entities residing here are Noosphere dwellers, and any time a piece of media is created, an impression is made in the Noosphere that a dweller can enter to create a UIW-AM. To control the UIW-AM, you must control the dweller that resides in it. So they attempted to make their own artificial dweller, Lila, who was identified via the first gold document to be a being who exists because people think of her, thought given form. People are made up of reels, their memories and such, and Lila has one as well, though she has no need for it. It just lets us visualize her. It was made by the Lawrence fraternity thinking they had any sort of control over a being like that. Lila shares a lot of similarities with Lilith, but it's unclear she actually is Lilith. And now, after that brief recap, let's take it to Detective U. So, a Hierophant. Will has come a long way to learn the truth behind the fraternity, didn't he? Yeah, right. A lot of hoop jumping just to learn what I could have already told him myself. By the way, you... That fire was your men's job, wasn't it? Yes. It was us. Obviously, Lawrence was aware of the FBI knowing of UIW-AM. Moreover, we've been utilizing them proactively for the last 10 or 15 years. We were a bit late with the fire, though. Now, Lawrence is in a place where there's no time at all. So it was you lot who stole all my food. He called Lawrence when I was asleep. I know. What did they talk about? Did he read what was in the secret file? Come on, detective, you know I'm curious. What was written here? I'm not sure if you're playing with me here, Lila. You, you are a haze composed of many human minds intersecting. A construct of thoughts of many hosts. Wait, how'd you- As long as there are humans who know about you, as long as you have hosts, you can't be killed. So are you gonna just- There, there doesn't seem to be a different way to do it. I... I'm so sorry, I... You points the gun at Will's body. He was the last person to have direct contact with Lila via the Lawrence fraternity. Thus, with the destruction of his body, Lila would be unable to use anybody else as a vessel. Right? Oh... Oh god... I'm... So sorry, Will. It's never that simple as a detective. You... You tricked me, Lila. 
Your sorrow is exquisite, detective. I haven't had such a feast in a while. If I knew just how rich your pain was, I'd never even bother to inhabit William. <laughs> you are horrible, Lila. Well, that's a harsh thing to say. At least I'm not the one to kill an innocent boy, detective. You need to leave. I... I need a moment. It shows just how manipulative Lila is, tricking you into killing an innocent kid. Again here, Lila mentions a feast. Originally, with the context of the classified document from the hero fan ending, I thought the food, and thereby the feast, was the fact that the cultists simply knew about Lila. That could definitely still be the case, knowledge of Lila is still her food, but emotions seem to fuel her even more. Looking back, Lila was smiling as you was pointing the gun at Will, and by extension, her. This should be your clue that something's not right. If you're being threatened with your version of death, and you're just smiling, I mean, it just doesn't add up. This smile, coupled with what she said when they discussed the death card, should lead you to the conclusion that Lila is baiting you into killing William. If you alt F4 the game instead of shooting Will, he'll remain alive. Not bad, detective. You're much smarter than you look. No nourishment for me today, I guess. Well, I'm sorry, but you won't trick me that easily, Lila. Let's proceed with our conversation. Depending on whether you shoot or spare William, the portrait will change for the rest of the game anytime you speak with you. Sparing William, the portrait will remain the same. However, shooting him, we get Lila's portrait. Comparing it with Tanya's portrait, they look quite similar. In the Temperance ending, she seems jealous that William confused Tanya for her, calling her a copycat girl. Speaking of Tanya, let's go to when they first met. When going for any of the interrogation endings, you meet this girl who says she met you at a party that Will attended a few weeks ago. This game doesn't have, like, free roam or anything. You need to find addresses and ride the bus to them, like how we got the address to the train station from Strepnev or the address to Lawrence's apartment from the Empress. She gives you the address to the party. The party took place four days after Will explored the apartment. November 20th. It's here, at this party, that Will meets Martha, Mike, and most importantly, Tanya. He seems a bit nervous around her. They take a walk in a field where they talk and learn more about each other. Tanya seems to be really down on herself, not feeling worthy of the friend she has, of the love that Mike gives her, nothing. William lifts up her spirits, and by the time they get back to the party, slow dance music is playing, and they dance together. What? Where am I? Who are you? No, I... It couldn't have been her. I've... I've never even... This is the moon ending, showing how Tanya and Will came to know each other. The moon tarot shows fear and anxiety, the same emotions Will seems to exhibit when meeting the stranger. Coming across the stranger in the end, he tells Will she had her face. Obviously in reference to how Tanya looks very similar to Lila. This isn't the first time we've seen the stranger, as they were the statue from the Emperor ending. Back in the Temperance ending, Lila tells Detective Hutchins this. So, backtracking a bit. Alright, if Will did this, how did he do it? I don't know everything. He was able to tire me out, to keep me hungry long enough so I didn't look through his eyes anymore. But I remember him meeting this... copycat girl. The spark of remembrance was nutritious enough for me to catch a glance of her. It all happened in a room, full of people. There was music. 
while Will and Tanya dance right before they're about to kiss, an owl appears on screen. Remember, Lilith is depicted as a humanoid night demon, the nocturnal queen as Lila puts it, or sometimes as an owl. Tanya looks similar to Lila. Will loves Tanya as he loved Lila. These two connections were enough to remind him of Lila and let her start to see through his eyes again. Will remembering Lila freaked him out enough to write in his journal that night. It can't be, they just look similar. It's her. I forgot for a time, but I recall her face. It's her, it cannot be not her. The moment in the Temperance ending is not the first time we've heard of Lila being tired or asleep. It was mentioned when speaking with you about the Hierophant ending as well. So what does she mean by that? Now that we have the daemon, things can be revealed that we had no idea about before. Exactly like with the rotary phone, we have to have the daemon open while at specific areas. Having him open while viewing the painting of Lilith, it'll say... To pretty much the entirety of the world, you have an advantage here. I, as an American, didn't understand. This is a date, November 13th. Setting the date on your computer to November 13th, or if you're really patient, waiting for it to roll around naturally, this happens. Please don't come closer. Stay in the corner there, please. They're all dead, aren't they? The newsletter said so, even Father Lawrence. Ooh. And I have to say it now. Lila, I won't kill any more animals for you. I- that dog was... Lila, why did you tell me to stay home that day? I'm sorry, I- I can't do this anymore. You have to leave. I don't know where. You must be just a piece of me. You are not more than I am. So why can't you just leave? Please! Please, stop with this nonsense, Will. You know I can't leave you. But something has to change. Don't worry too much about it. It's important to keep a clear mind. And it will be just like a swap of lenses in a kaleidoscope. Or reels in a movie projector. Don't run from it. Just let me. No! Don't touch me! So, the fire, the calamity as the daemon calls it, occurred on the 13th of November. Lila spared Will by telling him to stay home the day of the fire. He was the only one she spared. She must see something in him. Of course she does, he's the perfect vessel for her. Lia feeds off of emotions, and Will definitely has a lot. When speaking with Strepnev at the train station, Will asks if the animals that the cult was using to feed Lila survived. Strepnev just laughed at him for caring about some silly animals. He even asked what Lila saw in him, which is extremely ironic. The exact reason Strepnev is laughing at Will is the same reason Lila chose him. This interaction seems insignificant, but it shows that of the cult members, Will was the most emotional. The others, if they were anything like Strepnev, seem very apathetic. This is another avoid the dude section, like how it was with Strepnev in the Empress ending. Will enters this really tall tower and into a room filled with trash projector reels. On an active projector, Will takes one of the reels. Lila's real. It's useless now, Will. You, you, you think you've got the upper hand? You're just delaying the inevitable. It's no use. This is the tower ending. The tower tarot shows sudden change, upheaval, and chaos. Throwing her reel into the pit, it causes Will to forget about Lila, putting her to sleep in his mind. Without a reel, humans can't understand Lila, can't visualize her. In Will's mind, there's no Lila to speak of. What are these reels? What's on them? This garbage you humans collect throughout your life. Memories, habits, Although sometimes you get something good. Are you referring to yourself? Well, obviously. You humans still need something to see me as. So you construct a projection of me. The same way you construct projections of other people you know. All your identities are just silly pieces of film illuminated by the prince. Again, another mention of the prince. Projectors work by shining a light through the lens to display an image. 
the prince sounds like this light. Earlier, I said that the prince sounds like us, the player, because we can project ourselves onto the characters of video games. The prince is the player. The prince is each and every human on Earth, but not for the reason I stated earlier. The prince is the projector light. We are the projector light. When we play this game, or any game for that matter, we are casting our attention, our light, onto the characters. As long as people know about something, its image is displayed via the prince's projector light. Whenever you lose interest in something and it gradually leaves your consciousness, it fades from your light. It's not displayed anymore from the projector. Lala discusses this concept more about consciousness and perception in another ending, but we'll get to that later. Having the daemon open while we enter the kitchen, a key will appear on the table next to Will's diary. It's the key to Tanya's locker, and opening it, there are two things. A locked phone and a sticky note. Oh, and Graves, don't forget to check out my Twitter. My name's at Tanya Kenned1899. The pinned post on her Twitter is from her father, saying that she was murdered November 29th, nine days after Will met her at the party, and found sometime in December. Her Twitter mainly consists of retweeted pictures of cats and some poems including the body's beauty sonnet that I read earlier. In one tweet of her, she compliments the pendant on a cat's collar, which is the password to her phone. Also, her profile picture isn't her face, it's Lila's. Actually, every instance of Tanya's face outside of her own portrait is replaced by Lila's. The missing person poster has Lila's face on it. Even small things nobody really pays attention to, like the trophy case in school, Tanya's award has Lila's face on it there, too. There are notes on her phone, one being a shopping list, and the second being her new address to avoid giving FedEx her old one. There are also text messages from multiple people. Williams from a week ago. Don't come. I changed my mind. What the hell, dude? No, I'm totally coming. Will? You are right. I'm not joking. I don't want to see you anymore. Please don't come. Dude, I can see something's wrong. I don't care. I know you're scared and trying to push me away again. I'll be waiting for you there. Don't come if you don't want to, but I'll be there. I'm not joking. I don't want to see you anymore. Please don't come. I'm gonna come. According to Will's friends, Tanya had been missing for six days before being found in the dumpster. So one week ago definitely coincides with the date of her murder. This could be Will freaking out, thinking that he's talking to Lila and not Tanya, since if you'll remember in the interrogation endings, he confuses her for Lila, and in the tower ending, it's obvious he's scared of Lila. Mike's messages have Tanya again expressing her self-doubts. Will immediately deletes the messages with Martha, and then there's Ellie Cooper from a week ago. Gorge, you there? Yeah, sorry, just texting Martha about, you know. Yeah. So, what was that dream you had? You wanted to tell me, remember? Yeah, it was a cool one. I was like this gorgeous woman sitting amongst puppies and roses and a myriad of other flowers which I didn't know the names of, completely nude. And there was this faint music in the air. Like, my hair was golden, for some reason. Completely golden. I was combing it with a little comb, adorned with so many little symbols. I think it was copper. Holy shit. That's a detailed dream. Did it end there? No. After a while, I noticed something strange. It was like one of the poppies was different from the rest. Its bud was hanging lower than others, and as I came closer to it, as I turned to look inside, it turned out there was a mirror inside of it. I saw my own face, but um, the eyes in the mirror were insane. They weren't mine, they were... It sounds like she's loosely describing the Lady Lilith painting again, a girl sitting among flowers combing her golden hair. There are some inconsistencies, like that in Tanya's dream she was naked, while in the painting Lilith has a white dress on. Either way, it's clear that she's describing Lilith. And then in the second half, looking in the mirror, she sees not herself, but Lila. If anything, this dream was a warning, a premonition of Lila coming for her. This, coupled with the odd text from William, were two warnings given to Tanya. Warnings that she did not heed, ultimately ending with her murder. There's also a text from an unknown number telling her she's in great danger, telling her to visit his website. This strange way of typing aligns exactly with Ribkin's typing in his website. And also it's the same number, so yeah, this is Ribkin. Also, this makes it three warnings that Tanya didn't heed. Going to the address from Tanya's notes, we get the rest of that bit of dialogue from the interrogation endings.
But this is so wrong, isn't it? I guess so, yeah. Do you love me, Will? Yeah. Yeah, I think I do. What's wrong? I'm sorry, it just felt weird to say that for some reason. I mean, I... I get it. If I were you, I wouldn't trust myself either. No, 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 it's not about that. You just remind me of someone I knew. Is that so? Honestly, I feel a bit offended, but... After what I did to Mike, I don't really deserve anything better, do I? But aren't you... Aren't you Lila? Huh? What was that you said? Aren't you Lila? What? If it's a joke, I don't get it. Who's Lila? Some girl you like? No, no, it's... I don't remember who that is. I don't... I don't remember. I don't remember! Will? Will, are you alright? Will? Yeah. Yeah, I'm alright. My face just doing its shenanigans again, I guess. Don't worry, dear. It's difficult for me to express emotions. I envy other people. They make faces naturally, but I have to make a conscious decision. Something's wrong. What the hell's going on, Will? Tell it to be quiet. Will's not here anymore. Please, Please be, be quiet. quiet. Everything's, Everything's alright. Right. What's it's gotten into you? you? Well, well, if this is a prank, don't even bother calling me again after that. What the fuck is in your arms? I don't understand, Will. This is too much. It's... You don't look like him at all. Will, what's happened to you? See, Will? This is what you get for trying to get rid of me. Watch carefully. You can begin. Sure. sure. There's, There's no, no need, need to, to scream, scream Tanya. Everything's... Will freaking out and then immediately going back to normal is... strange. We know from when you shot Will that Lila thrives on strong emotions. This emotional outburst from Will could have been the thing that she needed to grab hold of him for good. In Will's kitchen, Lila and the stranger have cornered Tanya. Lila seems very spiteful for the events in the tower here. This is her character. Spiteful, egotistical, other negative traits. These are mainly revealed via the discussions with you, where we can get a clearer view of who she really is, not hiding behind the facade of Will. She's still never really fully honest, though. And then the stranger. This character is mysterious. Here, the party, and the Noosphere are the only places that they show up, and there's never any explanation at all for their existence. Hell, even the fan wiki doesn't offer up any suggestions. The stranger is a strange and mysterious character that appears at a few points throughout Who's Lila. Yeah, thanks man, real insightful. When talking to you about the moon ending, the subject of the stranger comes up. By the way, what was that figure in the corner? Are you talking about the stranger? Yes. He looked a bit like William, didn't he? It's just... it's not his usual look. When Lila tells the stranger to keep Tanya quiet, she says that Will isn't here anymore. Will watches from the entrance of the kitchen, but I don't think he's really there. Just a silent observer, unable to do anything but watch. This may be what's happening with the stranger. Notice how the stranger looks very similar to Will, just more feminine. This may indeed be Will, but fully taken over by Lila. 
Will can't do anything but watch helplessly while Lila controls him like a puppet. And with Lila saying it's not his usual look in response to the stranger looking like Will, it may be the case that when Lila is in complete control, that Will would look different. There's also the fact that the stranger is the only character outside of William to have spoken dialogue. Literally nobody else except for Will has an actual voice, except one line from Strutnev. So the fact that the stranger has one may be saying that they're actually Will. There's one more piece of evidence for this, again, in the Temperance ending. Do you know this girl? Of course. She's the reason I'm here, talking to you. And why is that exactly? Because she looks exactly like me. And because my little William slaughtered her. William being? This boy's assigned name. William Clark. He was the one to invite me in. She's saying that William murdered Tanya, but we know it was the stranger, so Lila is saying that William is the stranger. Again, what Lila says isn't trustworthy. She lies and toys with people for fun. This theory has a lot of holes. How come Lila looks like Will in the Wheel of Fortune ending when Will has literally zero control over his body since he's the machine? How come every time Lila is in Yu's office, she still looks like Will and not the stranger? And then every other instance of Lila being in complete control and still looking like Will? A much, much, much likelier answer that embarrassingly enough took me until right now as I'm editing this section to think of is that he's a physical manifestation of Will's connection to Lila. He only appears in sections relating to Lila. First in the Noosphere, her plane of existence if we go under the assumption that she's a Noosphere dweller. Second, after dancing with Tanya, where Will was reminded of Lila's existence. And third, when Lila fully came back into his mind. In that third and final section, the stranger bent to Lila's will, did everything she commanded him to, maybe hearkening back to the romantic interest Will had for Lila early on, with the stranger aiming to make her happy by doing as she says and killing Tanya. This ending is the lover's ending. When upright, its keywords are love, harmony, and relationships. This could represent the connection between Will and Tanya, but also a ghostly connection to how Will felt about Lila in the past. Talking with you about this card, Lila deflects all of the blame onto William, masking herself as an invisible hand guiding him to finish what he started. I definitely don't believe this, since Will has been shown time and time again to be a kind-hearted individual. He's just a good dude. As you says, Will is not a killer. She seems jealous of Tanya here, basically saying that she had to die since Will mistook Tanya for herself. That's another negative trait of hers, her vanity, which is a trait she shares with, again, Lilith. She saw Tanya as similar looking to herself, but not as beautiful, so when Will mistook the two of them, she took it as a personal attack. That is why Tanya needed to die, for the crime of looking too similar. Do you remember how I said that Lila speaks a lot about consciousness and perception in another ending? Well, let's get to that now. Going down the interrogation route, when Mike confronts you on the roof, you can anger him to the point that he pushes you off of the roof. Waking up, you're in a hospital. This is a flashback to September 15th, as that's when Will writes about this in his journal. Will here, again, is a silent observer, just like in the lover's ending. So, I've been meaning to ask you. When I'm not, like, visually imposing you, where do you go? <laughs> well, nowhere really. I just stop, you know, being. Oh. It must be really scary. <laughs> Not really. You do it all the time too, well, when you lose consciousness or when you sleep without dreams. So not existing is like being asleep? It's not really like anything, as there isn't someone for whom it's like something. Not being doesn't really happen to anybody, per se. Well, you just said it happens to me sometimes. It's very bold of you to assume that some you actually exists. <laughs> but Lila, you aren't making any sense now. I am here. I'm talking to you. Is that so? And how would you describe that I? Um, I... I don't know, like... Like I'm young and maybe overanalyzing and... And I really like lemon soda and I broke my knee when I was in kindergarten. So you are your personality and your memories? Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. You see, Will, there's a problem with what you just said. Oh yeah? Yes. Let's pretend for a moment you're right, and you really are your personality, memories, and so on. 
But isn't the one listening to me right now also you? Huh? Sure. And the one seeing me is you. And the one feeling all the different things is you. Let's call this you the perceiver. Uh huh. We like to imagine the perceiver as a pupil of an eye. The perceiver may cast his gaze upon anything. Colors or sounds touch your feelings. But how do you imagine it looking at itself directly? A mirror? Oh, I wouldn't trust the mirror, my dear William. A ghost on the other side may only look like us. So, alright, in that sense it really can't. The pupil can never see itself. So what? It means that whatever the pupil can perceive is not it. You can analyze your memories and your personality, yet the real perceiver always stays in the shadows. One of his human names is the Prince, although he doesn't really have a name, of course. In that sense, there isn't really a difference between you and other people, Will. Huh? What do you mean? For you, why do other people exist? I mean, their minds, memories, and so on. In their heads? Wrong. You have no ability to see what's inside someone's head. To you, people are a fictitious creation. A number of expectations generated from their actions. A phantom existing exclusively in your head. And the funny thing is, your own personality is too. What? I'm real, Lila. Even if other people may be imagined by me, my own character is- What's the definition of imaginary? Something that exists just in my mind? And where does your personality reside? I- It's alright, my sweet William. You, your memories, your mind. These are only temporary shards of coloured glass. The visioner, the perceiver, the prince may only look through them and imagine for a moment that he is these shards. He never truly becomes them, and it's surprising how quickly he may look away from one to another. Remember, Will. The moment he looks at another one of them, he might think he's someone different. The crux of this dialogue is that you are not you. Your memories, your experiences, your being would not exist without the prince. You aren't real. The people you know, the people you love, they aren't real either. They're just shells powered by the prince's light. This strikes Will, leaving him too stunned to even speak. His entire sense of self has been shattered and it terrifies him. I mean, wouldn't you feel the same way if you learned that you aren't yourself? You're just some thing animated by this prince creature. Your memories are false. Your desires, your distastes, everything is false. Earlier, I said that the prince was us, the player. In the context of video games, movies, etc., yes, we are the prince. We play these games and connect to these characters. We peer through their eyes, perceive the world as they do, take into account their personality and memories. We are essentially their mind as they reside in ours. We look through their colored glass of self, but we'll never be them, no matter how intense our connection with them is. Without our light shining through their film, they wouldn't exist. In the grander scheme though, we aren't the prince. We're no bigger or better than these pixels on the screen. Somewhere in a realm beyond our understanding, much like how video game characters can't conceptualize our world, there are beings watching us, looking through our colored glass of self, connecting with us. Without their light shining through our film, we wouldn't exist. Our prince. Our memories, as said by Lila, are temporary. Eventually the prince will get bored and will remove his gaze from our colored shards. And of course, there's a prince for them, and a prince for their prince. Now. Obviously, I'm just taking the game's ideas and pushing them to the extreme. I obviously don't think there are supernatural spiritual entities that look at our memories and experiences and animate us. Or do I? I might be a crazy motherfucker, you never know. Reaching the tallest floor of the building, we come across the veil. We are introduced to a new character here, Yachin. Yachin was one of the two pillars of Solomon's temple, the first temple in Jerusalem. Inside the temple rested the Holy of Holies, which ancient Jewish traditions viewed as the spiritual junction of heaven and earth. It's the Noosphere again, but a different part of it. When we were in the Noosphere in the Emperor ending, we played on the gameplay portion of the screen. Here, we're playing on the portrait portion. We are inside William's head. On a hill sits a projector. Here, we have three options. The first, completely ignore the projector and hop onto a boat rowing down the river.
This is the High Priestess ending. The card's keywords are Sacred Knowledge, Divine Feminine, and the Subconscious Mind. By leaving Lila's Reel in Will's head, Lila persists. Going and replacing Lila's Reel with Will's Reel obtained in the Wheel of Fortune ending, we get the Hanged Man ending. The card's keywords are Pause, Surrender, and Letting Go. By removing Lila's Reel from Will's mind, Lila is no longer a part of him. At least until something makes him remember, just like with Tanya. Just like with the Lawrence fraternity and how their Reel didn't contain Lila, Will's Reel didn't either. It just let her exist in his mind. Now with her gone, he should be 100% William again. And then if you go back without William's reel, and take Lila's reel, leaving the projector empty, you get the Fool ending. The Fool card's keywords are innocence, spontaneity, and a free spirit. Without any reels, Will is unburdened by memories and any mind. Basically, Will is starting from a clean slate in this ending. He's nobody anymore. Well, alright! That's all the endings. I guess this video is over. Wait. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. We're missing one. B but where? Going back to Tanya's Twitter, there's a tweet that you're likely to deem unimportant at first glance. Been at the Sunshine Cafe once again today. It always feels so welcoming, yet makes me feel so strangely somber. Anyway, I think I'll return there again soon. Check it out if you'd like. It's located at 200 Grand Beaver Avenue. To go to places, you use addresses that Will writes down as he finds them. So whenever you go to a bus stop, it'll be there ready to click. But since this address is found outside of the game, it's not added to the address list. Copying and pasting it, we're taken to the cafe. Coffee as usual, Lila. Thanks. Detective View's been here earlier today. Huh? Really? Yep. He didn't ask anything about you, though. Hmm. <laughs> Makes sense. He doesn't even need to, that sneaky jerk. <laughs> yeah. Is he still figuring out, you know, who you are? Well, obviously. We wouldn't be here if he wasn't, would we? Well, yeah. Have you thought that maybe he's just giving us some more time out of pity? I mean, it could be that he already knows you're a... Shh! Shut up! <laughs> Sorry, I'm just teasing. Oh, come on! You know you's listening even now. Sure, otherwise I wouldn't be here talking to you. He must think he's really powerful, mustn't he? I guess so. He's certainly good at figuring things out. A nosy guy, I'd give him that. Well, at the end of the day, it's his curiosity that keeps us alive. That and his pain. Yeah, poor guy, actually. To think how much of the time he gives us is filled with suffering. What's he doing it for, then? He hopes for that sliver of satisfaction. Our world is built so gives him little pieces of info so he feels as though he's getting somewhere. Doesn't he realize that 90% of his time consists of pain and only like 10% is goodness? I don't know. Even so, he's a machine of pain. A suffering generator, as all humans are. At least his attention is what keeps... Well, come now. Don't give out too much. I know we haven't talked in a long time, but... he's listening. <laughs> yes. He'll pester me about this for sure when I come back. Do you have to? It's... up to him. It's up to you to decide. Well, thanks for coming today. I rarely see you these days. Yeah, I kind of missed all this. Did you pick up on that? It's up to you to decide if Lila goes back to his office. It's up to you to decide if Lila goes back to Yu's office. You is you. You are you. You two are one and the same. Exactly how Yu analyzes each of the endings to get a clearer picture of who Lila is, you do the same. Exactly how you play through each ending over and over again to try and find something new, you is there at the same time, meticulously scanning each area in which Lila roams. Lila says that most of the time Yu gives to her are filled with suffering. This is true for the player as well. 
That agonizing feeling of knowing so much, but at the same time, so little. Even after everything, it still feels like we're only at the surface of finding out who Lila is. The reason the discussions with Yu don't feel like boring recaps is because, one, they aren't, but also because Yu doesn't know everything. He, in fact, knows next to nothing at the start, just like we did. We, just like Detective Yu, are enthralled with the mystery. From the name of the game posing a simple question to the actual deeper layers of the story, we want to know each and every detail. Detective Yu was pretty much at the exact same point we were at the start, not knowing much aside from the fact Lila killed Tanya and Martha. But as these discussions continue, Yu's knowledge of Lila, as well as our own, expands. Leaving the cafe, we get the sun ending. The sun card's keywords are warmth and success. To quote directly from Biddy Tarot, if you're going through a difficult time, the sun brings you the message you've been waiting for, that things will get better, a lot better. Through the challenges along your path, you discovered who you are and why you're here. I chose to speak about this ending last, as even though there is no first or last ending, this definitely feels like a bookend to the game, with success even being a keyword for the card. Through playing this game and trying to make sense of it all, you're uncovering the mystery piece by piece. With all the conflicting information about who Lila is, it's hard to feel as if you're moving closer to knowing it at all, but you know a hell of a lot more than when you started. Lila brings up this conflicting information when you talk with you about the High Priestess ending. Just who are you, Lila? Oh, I'm Will's Tulpa. He made me after the passing of his mother to you. Oh, wait, wait, no. I'm the vengeful spirit of the girl named Tiny Kennedy and... Oh, no, wait. I was a scientific experiment conducted by the US government to brainwash its citizens to... Or am I a metaphor for mental abuse everybody has seen about a hundred times already? Or am I a twisted incarnation of Will's dark, tormented psyche? Ooh, what is it, detective? There are lots of theories about what Lila is, with none of them really jumping out as correct. We may never know who or what Lila is, but I suppose this game isn't about the destination, but rather the journey. Oh wait, I suppose we can talk with Detective Yu about this card. What was that all about? Machine of Pain? Me? You love it when it's about you, don't you? What? I... I mean, I don't care. We can talk about something else if you'd like. What did she mean when she said that my curiosity keeps you alive? You're so close to finding out the truth. Do you realize that, Detective? Just answer my question, Lila. Why are you saying that it's up to me? Come on, Detective. You're almost there. I don't... I can't yet. Please, can't you just tell me? If you've spoken to you about each of the other 14 endings, we get this bit of dialogue. If it's easier to understand that way, an identity is like a piece of semi-transparent film. It lies in a ray of light. So the light thinks it's that piece of film. Doesn't light itself want to know what it is? I know I want to know what light is. Neither the film nor the light want things. It's just written on the film. I want to know what light is. I don't get it. It's like if when reading a book. On their own, the characters are just a bunch of symbols. But your attention makes them kind of alive. It's as if they borrow your mind as simulation space to play out their consciousness. It's like a wind-powered walking machine. Her attention makes it move and act as a living thing, but when it's still, it loses its meaning. Wait, so you, on the other hand, you are composed by an intersection of many rays of attention, aren't you? Very good, yes. But even if I were to get rid of all of them, you wouldn't disappear. Why? Well, I guess I can just straight up tell you. No! No! Fuck, no! Sometimes a piece of film is designed in such a way that when catching a line of attention once, it tries to do every little thing to keep it to itself. It creates mazes and unbelievable fractals of mystery. You see, the beauty of it is, its structure is not random. There's always an underlying logic. 
and a single correct interpretation of its narrative. But is it even obtainable at this point? I don't know. This piece is always designed to be just about explainable. But small contradictions and unspoken details usually prevent the full picture from being formed. So what? Is it all too? Yes, yes. So this must be the most vile and the last trick of them all. I sat for a while after receiving this ending. The first thing to do was find the missing piece of dialogue, which, thanks to data miners, has been revealed. My nature is exactly this. I am all this. I am not a tulpa, nor the mother of UIW-AM. Not even Lilith or an archetype. And yet I am all those things. I am the mystery of not knowing who Lila is. As long as the one playing this game doesn't understand what I am, I will remain alive in their mind. I am the mystery itself. I was designed in a way that makes me just about explainable. But at the end of the day, I am no more than a simple question. Who is Lila? So, Lila is a haze, composed of many human minds intersecting, as you suspected in the Hierophant ending. He was on the correct track, but was ultimately incorrect. Anytime anyone has scrolled past this game, seen the title Who's Lila, clicked the game, bought the game, looked around, got bored and trashed it, or stuck through it to the end, has fed Lila. Lila is now a part of you. That is the most vile trick of them all. Hooking you with the mystery only to infect your mind with it the deeper you delve. Lila confirms this herself if you go back to Yu's office. You are here. Again. What do you want? We've told you the story as well as we could and there isn't much left to see. Are you here to hunt for secrets? That may be a somewhat fruitful endeavor, I guess. But there isn't much point in us anymore, is there? This construct we have built, it has served its purpose. By serving its main function, the system has inevitably ruined itself. That's not a bad thing. After all, its purpose was to inject us into you. Now you may live on, unconstricted by the time you decide to give to this. Anyway, if you're here for a recap, please help yourself. Thinking back to the Emperor ending, when he mentions that a vessel for his kin has come, he was not speaking to or about William. It was towards us. The construct that she mentions is the game itself, and she's right. We have all the pieces of the puzzle now. We don't technically need this game anymore. All the information presented is in our heads now, and as such, so is Lila. You might think that because we know that Lila is the mystery herself, that she would not be with us anymore. We know her secret, we know what she is. But do we? There are still so many questions about her existence, and that's why she will always persist, because those questions will never be answered. How did Lila come to be? When did she come to be? Will she ever stop existing? What do emotions have to do with our longevity? It's these questions and a ton of others that spell eternal life for Lila. By looking at this game, playing this game, even watching this video, the question of whose Lila has been implanted into your consciousness forever. Of course, over time, you'll forget about Lila. You'll forget about this game. You'll forget about this video. Lila will no longer occupy your mind. But one day, like Will did when he met Tanya, you'll remember. You might see something about Lilith, or see a projector, or see an awkward smile. Lila will come back eventually. Lila's real is in your head now. She's a part of you. Forever. It might seem anticlimactic. You go through all this trouble looking for all the answers, and in the end, the answer is that there is no answer. Lila can never be fully explained, so is all the trouble we went through for nothing? Wasted time? I don't think so. The mystery is finding out that the mystery is the mystery. Through your trials and tribulations of trying to understand, you've inevitably ended up with more questions than answers. You've fed Lila more now, knowing all that you do than you did when you first installed the game. As our circle of knowledge expands, so does the circumference of darkness surrounding it, as was said by Einstein. The more we know, the more we realize that we don't know. That principle is Lila's lifeblood, the sum of her existence. And that's it for Who's Lila? That's the story. There are a couple easter eggs that I guess I could talk about before this video wraps up. In Lawrence's classified document, it says that Lila was to be the surrogate mother of UIW-AMs. At the very bottom of the document, there's a list of prominent UIW-AMs. Two are blocked out, there's Dada Dog and a strange one, T. 
the first successful child of Lila. The document says that T diverged from the meme format and was given a longer lifespan. T is the character from Garage Heathen's other game, Your Amazing T Gachi, in which you take care of a Tamagotchi-esque anime girl. The daemon is prominent in this game too, but I don't think he was ever named there. I also saw something on a Who's Lila forum post that said you could find the girl in the Noosphere Forest when you used a specific palette, but I wasn't able to find her. Who's Lila and T Gachi are connected in some way. Maybe Garage Heathen's games will be a giant connected story somehow. I can't say for sure since they've only released two games, but they have a new game coming out sometime in the future, Dystopian Debugger. I guess we just have to wait and see if there are any connections or references to these games in there. Okay, that's where I left the discussion about Tigachi originally, but going back and playing it, the girl mentions the Noosphere. He told me the days would come, the lonesome days. I heard them loud and clear this night. There can be no mistake here. Crackles like electricity, or wind in the dry trees. Blue flashes like flares. You can catch glimpses of the sycamore forest in the darkness below. It smells like ozone. The electricity referring to the electrical towers in the High Priestess, Hangman, and Fool endings. The blue flashes could be in reference to the color palette, and the sycamore trees being the same, or at least similar trees, all throughout the Noosphere. I don't know if there are any more strong connections like that, that one just stuck out to me. There's one giant easter egg that I really want to talk about, one that even has an achievement tied to it. William. By sneaking into your save data and intentionally corrupting one of the files, when you load it again, you're taken to a new environment. This game has had two types of environments, fixed camera point and click and first person 3D environment. This area is different. It's still point and click, but it's a huge area. The camera follows you and there are coordinates in the corner. It seems empty, but if you open Damon, it'll give you coordinates. Going to that spot, you encounter someone with a wheel for a head. William, obviously a play on the main character's name, William. You're allowed to ask him one question, and after you receive your response, he will disappear forever. There are 10 questions that are known to have unique answers. Anything else results in a simple, I don't know. Where am I? This, this is not supposed to be a place. This is the state to which the construct of thought fall down. Who are you? I am. I am a real that's not used anymore. As long as you give me attention, I exist. Can't stop being afraid. Who's Lila? Lila is the mystery of not knowing who Lila is. Who's Detective You? Your mind is a detective in ways. Who is the stranger? You, sir, should unmask. Indeed? Indeed, it's time. We have all laid aside disguise but you. I wear no mask. No mask? No mask! Are you the machine? Yes, the machine and I are one and the same. Daddy? Shame on you! The Emperor is but a trickster in disguise. His truths serve one purpose, to lead you on the wrong path. The same goes for all of them. 1899? This is not a time, but a place, rather. Both of them inverted. Don't forget that. Where is the body? His body is beneath. His hands are gripping the underbelly of the forest. What for? Indeed, why even bother if she isn't more than the question itself? Was all you found in vain? I do not think so. As the flowers are born to wither, so too is the imaginary machine that's being built only to completely obliterate itself. Fleeting beauty. Three out of ten are just recounting what we already know. We know that attention is needed to keep someone alive. We know Lila is the mystery, and we know you is you. The question what for was something I discussed briefly, so we don't need to talk about that either. Probably the strangest one, fittingly, is in response to the stranger. It almost reads like a conversation between someone and the stranger himself. I can't even lie. I stared at this quote for like an hour, and I still have zero idea what it means. William says that he and the machine are one and the same. If you'll remember, the machine was animated with William's reel. So does that mean that William is animated by Will's Real 2? When asked about Daddy, he freaks out, calling the Emperor a trickster trying to lead you on the wrong path. This is why, following his instructions and downloading Damon, you end up with the Hierophant ending tricking you into shooting Will. Asking about 1899 is strange, because to my knowledge, the date is only mentioned once in Tanya's Twitter handle. Now, first looking at it, you might think it's just random numbers like half of Twitter users have in their at but if it elicits a response from William, it must have some reason for being there. Looking a bit deeper into her Twitter account, you'll notice that she only follows two people, Cute Cats, which gives her justification for this tweet, and Alistair Crowley. Crowley was an English poet and leader of the secret society slash cult Ordo Templis Orientis, who lived between 1875 and 1947. 1899 falls between these dates, so my immediate thought was that this question was to do with Mr. Crowley. William says that it's not just a date, but a place. In 1899, Alistair bought Boliskine House in order to do religious exercise to invoke his guardian angel. This seems to parallel nicely with Father Lawrence and how he used his apartment to meet with the Emperor and utilize Lila. This might not be what the game was referring to, but with the connection between Lawrence and Crowley, the apartment and Bulliskine house, I'd say it's a fair bet. And the final question, asking about the body. 
There's no mention of the body anywhere else to my knowledge, and it never appears in game. Except it does. It's just out of sight. William says his body is gripping the underbelly of the forest. This isn't metaphorical. When you step beyond the veil into the noosphere, instead of fiddling with the projector or riding the boat, you can wander around until you find a gap in the rocks which act as a barrier preventing you from leaving. This gap is just big enough to walk through, and you can continue down until you fall out of the map. This somewhat resembles the mascot of the developer, Garage Heathen. This is beneath where William's projector is, so it makes sense that he's here. William would not exist if Garage Heathen did not make him make this game. William's mind exists off the back of the developer's labor. This game is fucking amazing. I've never played a game that has completely captured my attention such as this. The mystery was laid out beautifully. Even the easter eggs aren't just there for reference's sake, they tie into the story. The fact that Lila can never be fully understood is such a fascinating concept. Because of how the game is designed, we will never know who Lila is. Even if we understand what Lila is, she's the mystery, that won't make her go away because the mystery isn't solved. It can't be. This game delves into themes of the self, identity, and a bunch of other psychological things. Constant mentions of the prince really hammer home the fact that you might not be who or what you think you are. At the end of the day, this game, as Lila stated, was to inject the game into you so that the characters can live on forever. That and the concepts. In the same way Lila will come back to your mind, so too will the prince. You'll be left thinking, could it be? Could it be that our memories are fabrications, that we're just puppets to greater powers? Obviously, not to be taken seriously, just fun ideas to play around with. This game is truly, truly phenomenal. It is my favorite indie game of all time. It deserves all the praise that it can get, and it's saddening to see it's not well known. Watching this video is not a substitute for playing the game yourself, by the way. You can never get the whole picture from one of these videos, so go out and buy it. And if you want an even more in-depth video on this game, check out Flaw Peacock's nearly 8-hour video. Link in description. So, who's Lila? We don't know. We can't. She's the best mystery that can't be solved. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! Big thank you to the wonderful people on my Discord who provided voices for this video. Lee's Things for the voice of Tanya, Randora for the voice of Ellie, Retro Junkie for the voice of Ripkin, Thomas Kulantingsberg for the voice of Lawrence, Aubrey for the voice of Martha, Froggy for the voice of Lila, Griffin for the voice of Officer Hutchins, Mrao for the voice of Detective Fisher, Soup Yum for the voice of Detective Yu, Mika Nova for the voice of T. Gachi, Noko for the voice of The Waitress, Audio Curtis for the voice of Strupnev and The Emperor, and The Shiggler for the voice of Matt Hurley. All of their links are in the description. This video would not have been as good without their inclusion, and they have my sincerest thanks for being a part of it. And a huge shout out to channel members. I'm just Kentucky Fried Chicken, Connor Epic Man, Pod, Ten, Ten Vue, Ten View, sorry, MK Ultra Survivor, and Alexander Brobeck. Joining the channel as a member supports me a ton. It's $5 a month and you get a shout out segment like this, special channels in the Discord including video updates, and you get to see these videos a little bit early. Thank you so much for watching. Like the video if you liked it, dislike it if you didn't, subscribe if you want to, don't if you don't. I've been Howard, and I'll see you when I see you.